So each of the four Gospels tells a version of the familiar story I'm about to read, so it must be pretty important. Today's readings include two of these. I invite you to close your eyes and let your senses take you into the room described in the Gospel reading. Smell the dinner and the perfume. Hear the voices. See the people. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Preparing for today, I found myself recalling my first Sundays here at this church, sitting in the back, trying not to be noticed, fumbling with the hymnal, hymnal and unsure. I invite you to once again close your eyes and enter this room as the unnamed woman in the scripture, as the guest who anoints Jesus. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Live her, leave, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you have always, always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could, she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Let us remember all who have welcomed us and made a place for us at the table. So if you don't mind uh, starting with a little game, name that tune. Okay. Listen carefully. People playing along at home uh, have to just guess on their own. Uh, so we'll, we'll try another one here, okay? One more, one more tune here. Do you have it, Jenny? Yes, Jenny's got it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. They were both twinkle, twinkle, little star. 
Um, variations by Mozart. Uh, he wrote 12 variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and these are snippets from two of them. Uh, I bring this up to, to say that uh, that's what's going on here in the Bible. We've got variations on a tune, essentially. Um, you know, I, I think I probably knew at some point in seminary that the story of Jesus being anointed by a woman was in all four Gospels and then forgot. Uh, that in my mind, uh, that the anointing is a Matthew Mark story that Jesus uh, gets anointed by this woman. Um, and there might be some variations between their two tellings. And I forget that it's also in John and Luke, just with variations on the underlying tune. Uh, we're going to look at these texts a little more closely today. Um, so let's start with a little chart of comparisons of the uh, stories uh, in the four Gospels. Um, so... Uh, if you're observant, you'll notice I left out why, but that'll come later in the uh, sermon. So um, when it happens uh, is uh, during Holy Week in Mark and Matthew, the day before Palm Sunday, so I guess that makes it the first supper in uh, John's Gospel. And early in Jesus' ministry, in Mark, Luke has it chapter 7, I think it is. Uh, it takes place in different places. Uh, in Mark and Matthew, it takes place at Simon the leper's, or Simon the former leper's home. Uh, it takes place at uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's home in John. And it takes place in the home of Simon in Luke. Only Simon is no longer a former leper. He's now a Pharisee in Luke's gospel. Uh, unnamed woman... Uh, anoints Jesus in Mark and Matthew. It's Mary who anoints Jesus in uh, John. And it's an unnamed woman again in Luke who does the anointing. Only Luke makes this big point of making sure that we know that she's a sinner from the city. Uh, how Jesus is anointed? Uh, I left off some apostrophes. Um, Jesus' head in Mark and Matthew and Jesus' feet in John and Luke. And then who complains about this act? Uh, dinner guests in Mark. Um, it's not actually dinner in Matthew. It, they're just hanging out at Simon the leper's house. Um, so it's Jesus' disciples who complain about the waste of money. In John, it's a specific disciple. It's Judas who complains. And in Luke, it's Simon the Pharisee who complains. And he doesn't complain about the waste of money. He complains about Jesus allowing this woman who's a sinner from the city touch his feet. So, some variations on a tune that take place here. I don't know why we humans have a tendency to synthesize variations on a story into one story, but we do, taking away the texture and the creativity of the various authors. Biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine says that we might take one point from one story and combine it with another point from another story and get swept along reaching all kinds of strange and inaccurate conclusions. For instance, we might remember, and actually I'm going to go back to uh, this chart here. Um, we might remember that... Uh, it's Mary who anoints Jesus' feet in John's gospel. Um, and then we meet Mary Magdalene. We know Mary Magdalene in John's gospel. Um, and in Luke, it's a woman who's a sinner. And so we sort of take Mary and Mary Magdalene and the sinner, and she's from the city, you know, sinners from the city, right? And suddenly Mary Magdalene's a prostitute. And that's not in the Bible. But we do that sort of thing all the time. We mash these women together into one person. In fact, Mark is not saying at all that the woman anointing Jesus' head is a prostitute. Mark is saying that whenever you want to tell the gospel, to tell the full story, 
you got to say what she did and tell it in memory of her. Very different. One of my favorite lines in Luke's variation on the story is when Jesus says to Simon the Pharisee, do you see that woman? Or maybe he said, do you see that woman? Don't pass judgment on her, Simon. Don't label her a sinner and nothing else. See her. See her as a person. See her as whole. See her as more than the worst thing that she's done. The unnamed woman in Mark, Matthew, and Luke takes a huge risk by crashing the party. Uninvited, she comes in with costly ointment and pours it out on the body of Jesus. Imagine you're at a a dinner at Papillon. I think that's about as fancy as we get in Fremont. Uh, You're at Papillon restaurant across Mission Boulevard. Uh, You're in the banquet room. It's a a retirement party for a teacher who you've always respected. And, And in walks someone, walks directly over to the teacher and spritzes her with perfume. How would you feel? What would your reaction be to somebody just barging into this event of these friends supporting this retiring teacher? You don't know what's motivating this interloper to come in and spritz somebody as if they're walking through Nordstrom's. Uh, You can only speculate what would make this interloper come into this banquet. And the same is true with the gospel stories with the unnamed woman who anoints Jesus. We don't know what motivates her. The only thing that's clear is that there is something that is weighing on her, something that she's feeling passionate about and that she needs to do. She's going to risk rejection by an possibly physical ejection by coming into this party uninvited. Walking into a gathering of strangers is hard enough, even if you're invited. You know, walking into a church for the first time, that can be scary. Am I going to be accepted here? Are they going to take me as I am? Are they going to make me be something I'm not? The woman enters, uninvited, she opens her perfume and pours it on Jesus, and somebody starts complaining. I'm impressed by her willingness to risk rejection and judgment and ridicule. The story of the unnamed woman reminds me to see the other women in the Gospels, to notice the women who are so important to Jesus' ministry. As I read a list compiled by uh, Levine, I found myself saying, oh yeah, her, yes, her too, need to include her and her. So here's uh, Levine's list. Anna, the widow at the temple, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James and John, Joanna and Susanna, Mary and Martha, the daughters of Jerusalem who work, weep for Jesus, the various women for whom Jesus grants healing, Peter's mother-in-law, the Canaanite Syrophoenician woman with her demon-possessed daughter, the widow whose son Jesus raises, the bent-over woman in the synagogue, the women who watch Jesus' crucifixion, and the women who came to his tomb to anoint him. Each of these women has their own story. And some of these women were women of means. For example, according to Luke 10, Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. That is, she's a homeowner. The book of Acts tells us that the house church in Jerusalem is in the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. The woman who put her coins into the temple treasury, you know, the widow's mite story put her two little coins into the temple treasury. She had access to those funds, great or small, she had access to her own funds. The woman who anoints Jesus had access to enough funds to buy perfume that would 
cost, according to the story, is 300 denarii. That's about enough money to feed a family for a year. There is no reason to assume that any of these women, including the anointing woman in Luke's version of the story, earned her income through prostitution. Women could have been given gifts of money by family members. They could have earned money through textile work, pottery, wet nursing, healing, cooking and cleaning, hairdressing, even investing. Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene, Johanna the wife of Herod Antipas' manager, and another unknown woman simply named Susanna, and many others served as patrons of Jesus' movement. Levine points out that the women who followed Jesus followed him not because they were seeking freedom from some sort of repressive Jewish system that devalued them. They followed Jesus because he spoke to their heart, healed their bodies, and they found peace in his presence. It may be that many of the women who followed him also did so because he provided them a family that they otherwise lacked. Most of the women named in the Gospels are not connected to husbands or fathers. They may have found the stories they heard about Jesus compelling and affirming. Who knows what motivated the unnamed women who anointed Jesus. She may have been the only one of his disciples who really believed him when he said that by going to Jerusalem he was going to end up getting killed. And Mark does that a lot in his gospel. The faithful, the truly faithful people are almost always, except in one case, they are unnamed. The named people almost always at some point fall away in Mark's gospel. Perhaps it wasn't that. Perhaps she just noticed that Jesus was really stressed out and needed to relax a bit. And so this was an act of kindness, like getting a massage or something. Perhaps she wanted to proclaim Jesus king, and so she acted like Samuel, who sought out the next king of Israel and found a shepherd boy named David and anointed him by pouring ointment on his head. Perhaps she wanted to offer her blessing. Perhaps she wanted to offer her thanksgiving. And Jesus, in accepting her and her anointing, also risked rejection. On one hand, the grumbling of the dinner guests and disciples can exert a lot of peer pressure. On the other hand, allowing yourself to be pampered isn't always an easy thing to do. The unnamed woman and Jesus both invite us to risk rejection. When we started advocating for the Housing Navigation Center, I had no idea how much rejection we might face from the neighborhood. And I'm glad I didn't realize because it may have made me falter and not take the risk. I am so proud that we stuck to our convictions and continue to advocate for the Housing Navigation Center despite the neighborhood pressure. And it's pleasing to know that ground has finally broken on it and they are in the process of building. It's hard to see in that picture, but they're holding shovels for their ceremonial groundbreaking. And I'm glad we continue to risk the possibility of rejection by our neighbors by inviting the Clean Start Hygiene Unit into our parking lot twice a week. Following Jesus will do that to a person or a congregation. Side effects may include feeling moved to crash a dinner party or act upon a deep desire or deep conviction. Now, I don't know what risking we're called to do in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, I can tell you that every night in prayer for this week, 
I have felt like God is up to something. I don't know what it is at this point, but I am keeping my ears and my eyes open because I believe God is calling us to something and that something is probably going to involve some risk because following Jesus is risky. I hope you'll keep your ears and eyes open to the Spirit as well.